Good morning. I'm going to welcome you all this morning to service. Glad to see you this morning. Um, I will have to say, the Lord has humbled me, and I'm glad to be standing here today. So after my adventure yesterday, I'm sure some of you have seen on Facebook and heard, and I've heard people ask me questions to let you all know that Pastor will not be trying something so idiotic or foolish again without proper equipment and attire and smartness and more, like lots more people, you know, like 50 people if I do that ever again. <laughs> so, um, but I'm just very thankful that it didn't go worse. Uh, the truss is on the ground, still in shape, and everybody is still in shape. A couple bruises, but no one's banged up. Too bad. Um, that, and I think I may have thrown my back out yesterday. So, um, I am hurting this morning a little bit. I'm going to try and manage through today. Um, Tylenol and I probably do a wonderful thing for you for a little bit, but just pray that it goes away and I just take it easy. I think rain this week will help me to not have to get out there and focus on my garage so much and focus on what I need to be focusing on. Um, do you have a couple of announcements this morning? First of all, on the welcome tables, if you didn't get one, there is the van proposal for you that on November 7th we will have a special meeting after service. So in two weeks we'll have a special meeting to vote. All right, this is a voting meeting. I will vote specific only for the van. All right, this is a specific special meeting that we will discuss and uh, talk about um, what the church is willing or kind of vote a price in which we will uh, per to go forward in purchasing one. So I put together a proposal for you on the cost of it and we can ask questions, but we will be voting on November 7th on what to do. Okay, so everyone, if you have questions between now and then, please feel free to, to reach out and ask me. I put lots of information on there. Please take it home. Be glad to answer any questions, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, on another note, um, there is Olympians this afternoon. There is uh, Seniors Ministry on Tuesday, if I'm correct. They're still meeting on Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Come on down, join them. Uh, youth group Tuesday night. Now, next Friday night, we're supposed to have a progressive dinner. And uh, some of you seniors are asking me questions. Well, I was received information, just received information. I won't have a definite until I know for sure, but the band is supposed to be playing Friday night's football game, which means we will lose several of our kids that are supposed to be coming, so we may postpone. All right, but once I get further information, I will let you know by Tuesday, okay? All of you that are willing to do that, I will let you know in well in advance, okay? Um, so we do, uh, have that. We have Reverb coming up. Uh, the kids are all excited. Uh, they're inviting all of their friends, including one of my daughters who was invited to the entire Acadia house at the seventh grade. And uh, if they all come, I'm probably going to have to shave my head. So, <laughs> a reverse mohawk. So it's only down the middle. So, uh, all right. It won't look strange at all, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, Brett, Brett should do it all right. <laughs> yeah, and Michael, and Michael, the other, has to shave the middle of his beard and put put the rest of it in dreadlocks or braids. Excuse me. So, so uh, and he's he's willing to, to do that. So it's it's great. If they get their sixty. Uh, so we we probably will need a couple scholarships. I will know Tuesday night how many we will need. So I will pass that on as soon as I know to everybody. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything else as far as um, the regular stuff going on. Bible study for the ladies Wednesday morning at 9.30. Prayer meeting via Zoom on Wednesday night. Um, if you want that link, we'll post it both on Facebook and send it out in the email. Um, but I don't think there's any, is there anything else that is, that's coming up. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, our call to worship this morning is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Um, Susan isn't here this morning. She uh, uh, wasn't feeling too well or she had a runny nose and she didn't want to she hasn't had her test yet, so she wanted to be safe and stay home. So she's probably watching online this morning. Uh, so I will lead our singing here in a minute, uh, hopefully. <laughs> All right. But our call of worship is found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. And Peter writes, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. And we grow each time we gather to worship in that. So let us stand together as we begin and we'll sing hymn number 560, More About Jesus. And I'll try my best to stay with you, everybody. Okay. <laughs>
Higher ground, 549. In the third year of King Belshazzar, Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that I had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Eulonai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did, did as it pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a great, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram fero ferociously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power the large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. 
While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one lo looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of, the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evenings and mornings that, have, that has been given you is true. But seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, kids. Yes, come on down. Rachel helps us. What? Um, mommy just did 
David and Goliath with the... Yeah, I could imagine facing a big nine-foot giant. Mm -hmm. And so, now they destroyed so, him. One stone. That's right. Doesn't take much. Doesn't take much. Little as much when God is in it, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So, I just want to encourage you guys that if it's something you don't understand or something scares you when you're reading, you can go to somebody and you can get the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'm going to do a little acting. I don't think David did that to himself. No. Oh, you're just doing what happened to the giant? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We got a lot of giants. We got to slay people, but we got lots of people to help us, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to pray you guys to do that. Dear Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the people you surround us with that help us in the good times, help us in the bad times, help us to understand the truths, things that might scare us, the things we don't understand. And Lord, we're so grateful for church family that we can go to, we can ask questions, and we can find someone to pray with us and help us. Lord, I pray that you would just leave us and guide us in these days, especially with all the things that are going on around us, that we can seek to understand your will and your ways and be faithful to your call in our lives. I thank you for these kids. I pray you will help them, Lord, to continue to look to you and stand firm in their faith. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. My son. They got all the bases covered on that one. We turn our attention to our prayer time. Um, I do want to begin this morning. Fred and Debbie reached out to me, and they were really trying to be here today. They're, as they put it, their mind is willing, but their bodies are not cooperating. And so I want to ask us just continue to pray for... Um, Fred and Debbie in their battle. It's, she's dealing with vertigo, and he's dealing with coming out of his chemo treatments right now. So they're either one's good and the other one's not so good, or they're both not good. So it's, it's been a battle uh, for them. So um, I'll just continue to pray for them. And if you feel so inclined, I think even just a phone call or something to. Uh, starting her therapy and her. Just everything that's going on emotionally, mentally, physically, just, just pray for that for her, for her, her mom and the whole family as they process going forward uh, the steps that they're going to have to be taking to make changes uh, and stuff like that. So just continue to pray for them. Um, are there any other prayer requests this morning? Arthur Doyle, 95 of West Point. He has been rolled in. He's in the hospital. All right. Jay? Raymond and April, and Raymond is uh, down with some type of heart. And, uh, April, she has more testing. Alright, what did you say about Raymond? He had a he has, he has a illness, a flu bug or something. A bug? Okay. Alright, and April, more testing. Okay. Um, also, a friend of mine, um, family from our former church, they have a six month old grandson that is battling leukemia. Is it down? Daughter, granddaughter, excuse me, battling leukemia right now and asking prayer for pray, prayer for her. Carol? I would like prayers for the Armstrong family, for the Armstrong guy, and for the Poolers family, Peter Poolers family. All right. I want to thank you all for praying for my Uncle Rod. He passed away last week, and so just pray for my family as they go forward. Megan? Uh, my stepdad's father passed away this morning. All right, so Megan, the stepdad's father passed away. Jimmy? Yeah, prayers for Donna Sweet Scott. Going in for shoulder surgery the second of November. I think it's probably about three months left to get ahead. I don't know if it's a very one way or the other on the way to my mother. She's also badly being anxiety.
Uh, Dawn is having sh shoulder surgery on November 2nd and also praying for her right now as she's dealing with some anxiety and stuff. So I'm just gonna lift up Donna. Is there anything else? All right, well, let's join our hearts together and let's go before the Lord. Dear gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege to gather on a Sunday morning that we have to come freely to worship you, to join our hearts in praise for you alone are worthy, but to join our hearts in prayer as we seek your presence in our life. Knowing, Lord, that you promised to never leave us nor forsake us, we are so grateful. Yet, Lord, so often we fail and recognize that and standing firm in that. We ask right now, Father, that you would forgive us for those times so far, our disbelief, our lack of faith, or our straying, our wandering that we are prone to so often. Forgive us, Father, for our thoughts and, uh, Lord, our pride. Even. Lord, we thank you that you are merciful and you are gracious. You're so forgiving and we're so grateful for the wisdom that you bestow on us through your word. Help us to be people who are intent and open and listening and seeking, Lord, to follow the right path. That we might be the instruments of righteousness that you want us to be in this community. Lord, uh, that we are just broken people like others around us, Lord, that, that need Christ. And Lord, I pray that Christ would shine bright through us he, as he mends us and corrects us, as he, he makes us into a people that is holy and separate for his holy work. That we would be that light in this world, that we would be that salt, that we would be the love that so many people need, Lord, around us. And Lord, in our hearts, we want to lift up and lay these petitions as we come and cast our cares at your feet for the people around us that are hurting, for the people that are dealing with illness, with families that we, we love and know are dealing with loss. May you be the God of comfort. May you be the God of wisdom. May you be the God of discernment, Lord, that in each of these situations, you would answer a prayer according to your will and your way, and you would be magnified and glorified, and your name would be made uh, great in each one. That you would draw those that don't know you into a relationship with you, and that, and with you, and those that don't, that do know you, Lord, they would be strengthened in their faith as they move forward. We pray, Father, for for Fred and Debbie, and for their heart's desires to be here with their church family. And Lord, uh, physically right now, they've just been at a battle. And so, Lord, we pray for healing in them, Lord, and we pray that you would strengthen their spirits. You would help them, Lord, in this time to, to find the rest and the, and the healing in you. And, Lord, that they would be encouraged as well, Lord. I pray that uh, we, as, as the body, as their family, would just lift them up. We pray that you would just bring healing and strength to them this day. We pray for Hannah Baker, Lord, as she's going through this rehab from her accident. We pray, Lord, for her emotional state, her mental state, her physical state. We pray for her spiritual state as well. That, Lord, she would see in this, Lord, how you can love and could draw her through this horrible circumstance into a right relationship, into a place where you would uh, either save her or help her to just to come back to you. Wherever it might be, Lord, that you would be cl close to her and help her in this time. And she's in a foreign place, in a, in a place where she doesn't know a lot of people. And she would be receptive to the, the help that is there. Oh, Lord God, I pray for her family right now, for Melissa and Greg and, and the kids, Lord. I pray that you would just give wisdom and, and leading, Lord, in them. Lord, I pray for uh, our author, Arthur Doyle, Lord, as he is at the hospital with pneumonia. We pray for healing on his body. And for Raymond as he deals with this, this flu bug or something, Lord. And for April and the testing she has to continue to undergo. That you would just help them to heal and, and give them patience and endurance through this time. We pray for um, the Sawyer family and their granddaughter, Lord, as she's facing this, this illness. We pray for your healing and, Lord, for the strength in this little girl to work through this time. Be with the family as well. Strengthen them. We pray for the Armstrong family and the Poulos family as they have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you would just bring comfort and healing. We think of Megan's stepdad as well as he has passed. his father has passed away. We pray there for healing and comfort as they grieve the loss of a loved one and as it is not an easy thing. So Lord, we look to you, the God of all comfort. We lift up Donna this morning. She prepares for shoulder surgery and I know it's she's been in a lot of pain and she's been out of work this whole time and I know she misses doing what she what she does and Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to her as the surgery will uh, fix the problem and that you would just heal her body. And Lord, um, 
pray that you'd be with her, with her anxiety. Lord, that she would turn and trust in you as, as many times we all need that. To trust in your will and your provision and in your things. I just ask right now that you would just, as we gather here this morning to hear your word, that you would speak to our hearts. That you would help us to, to set aside all the distractions. That your spirit, as we look to Daniel chapter 8, would, would help us to understand the relevance of it to us today. And, and to understand how we are to respond and to react to these prophecies. To understand the, the place that we are and what we are to be doing now. For you name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go to Daniel chapter 8. And once again, there's a lot of information here that it seems like a history lesson for most of us because it deals with past history. But imagine yourself being in Daniel. Oh. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for my birthday gift. My mother, she was very, very happy. And I'd like to thank you all. Well, welcome. We're glad to have done it for Miss Geneva. What a great turnout, by the way, Wednesday night. Do you think it's kind of, it was phenomenal, so it was great. And also on a side note, I want to say thank you to all of you for your kind words and words of encouragement. They really lifted up my heart uh, this week reading those cards and words from you, my, my family. Uh, it meant a lot to me as your pastor to, to read those and just be encouraged this week, so thank you. All right? So anyway, back to Daniel chapter 8. Um, I've prayed all week and said, Lord, how do you preach history? How do you preach through this prophecy in, in a meaningful way? Because the reality is, the verse that we're going to really impact is, is the very last verse, verse 27. But I'm not going to just dive into that. I want to I unpack this vision. And I want to start by putting us in the mindset of Daniel. To understand this prophecy, to understand what's happened. Remember, Daniel just had a vision in the first year of Belshazzar. This, this picture of the entire time of the Gentiles, from, from Nebuchadnezzar all the way to when Christ comes and sets up his kingdom. He's been given this broad view from God's perspective, and it troubled him. All right, so he's got this view, and sometimes when we think about prophecy, we, we try to look at it from a human perspective. We look at, what does it mean to me? Well, we've got to step out of that. We've got to look at it, what God is trying to say. What is God trying to portray here uh, for us as believers, as we put our faith in God, how we are to live during this time. Because what God says is true, as it even says in here, this is true and real and it's going to happen. And as we find out today, it did happen. But in Daniel's day, he had no clue. And he's given these visions, these, these pictures of the future from God's perspective of what God is going to do to prepare and take care of Israel. Because really, Daniel's concern is for the people of Israel. They're in captivity. And God had promised that he would restore and redeem Israel. And so Daniel is probably looking, thinking now, he's been in captivity so many years. It's Belshazzar. He's got this dream. Belshazzar is not going to be king forever. There's going to be another power. What does that mean for Israel? What does that mean for us going back to the Holy Land? And so Daniel's got a big heart for his people. And so God, once again, in chapter 8, gives us another, gives Daniel another view, kind of microscopic, into the great big vision he had, but also a portrayal of what's going to happen at the end as the Antichrist listed here is a picture of what's going to happen at the end in dealing with Israel. And so we have this vision, all right? And so what happens is Daniel is taken in a dream from where he was to Susa, which is the capital or a prominent city in the Persian Empire, which would be modern-day Iran now. Okay, so he's gone from Iraq to Iran. You can picture it in your mind. He's, he's next to this canal, all right? It was a royal city, and it was 200 miles east of Babylon. So he's gone east. He's in a different place, and God shows him from this place he's going to raise up a mighty army that's twofold, the Medes and the Persians, all right? And we know that a century later, the Persian king, uh, Xerxes, um, would rule and reign, he built a beautiful palace in this Susa. So this is a prominent city in the, the Medo-Persian Empire. Okay? And which also gives tie into Nehemiah, who later under the king Artaxerxes, who was after Esther. So we're getting to biblical history here now when this is taking place. Because Esther was queen in the Medo-Persian Empire. Alright? Saved all the Jews herself. Or actually God used her to save the Jews. Um, but Nehemiah will come from Susa as the, it'd be the king come, come from there to restore the walls when the, 
temple is rebuilt. So just a little bit of background here to where Daniel is portrayed. That God is preparing him for something. Okay? And in this dream, we have this vision of a ram. And this ram had two long horns. Okay, so just imagine a ram with two long horns. Mention that this is a double uh, empire. And it also goes on to say that one rose longer than the other at a later time. But we know in history, once again, getting this history lesson here for you, that in, in history, the, the Medes were kind of a weaker army, and the Persians became the stronger portion of the two. And they went out to war, okay? So this ram is the picture of the Medo-Persians, and in verse 16, going on, when he's interpreted, he is told, this is going to be the Medo-Persian army that's going to come and destroy Babylon. This, this, this ram. Then it says there's a goat, all right? We all know who the, great, the goat is, right? It's not Tom Brady. Okay, all right, we got that out there, all right, for all of you that think of that greatest of all time, the greatest of all time with Jesus Christ, but this isn't that goat, all right? The vision of this goat is, is a single goat that comes, and just imagine something not walking on water. This goat comes, not even touching the ground, it just comes swiftly across the air and destroys the ram. Okay, so... So we see this ram, it wasn't able to be thrown at everyone that stood against it to the north, the, the west, and the, the south, which is once again going back to chapter 7, the bear with the three ribs, the three uh, lands that it had to, to conquer. It says that this, this goat came out of nowhere and it charged at the ram and destroyed it. And it destroyed it ferociously and broke the, the, the ram's two horns. Now. In history, we know that Persia tried to invade Greece during the time of Alexander the Great's father, and they defeated the Greeks. And so there's a picture of this as Alexander rose to power of his desire to destroy the Medo-Persians because of what they did on Greek land. And we, you can go find that in your local history. You can find all that. All right. And it says that it came swiftly. And in history, we know that Medo-Persia was destroyed very quickly. I mean, it was just, they didn't have a chance. And so what does this mean for us? What, is, what does this vision mean for us? I mean, it's great that we, we look at this, and, and Daniel's given a small portion of history, but there's a picture of something that's going to take place during the tribulation period right here in this time frame. Because we know that when Alexander the Great died, it says four horns came out, and those four horns were four generals that took over and split the Greek empire to four places, and then it says one other horn will rise. Now, last week we looked at a little horn that came out of ten and killed three. That has to do with the end times. That is dealing with Antichrist in the end. This is a different little horn. All right? But at the same time, the angel says what to him? Verse 17. He says, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. So what you're seeing here is going to be a picture of what is to come at the end when God deals with Israel. What is going to happen now is going to happen in further and greater advance at the end. Okay? So there's a picture here of what is going to take place in a few years that is kind of a portrait of what's going to take place at the time of the end. All right? So what is this little horn? Well, let's look and read it really quickly here. It says, out of one of them came, verse 9, came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice of the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. So this is, it has to do with Israel, because it says the sacrificial system is going to be um, desecrated. And right now Daniel's in Babylon, and the temple is in ruins. So there's no temple, there's no sacrifice, but one day the temple is going to be restored, the sacrificial system will be restored, and that something is going to happen to it. This goes to about one, I'm going to say probably about 175 B.C. Some 400 years after Daniel, a, a, guy, a Greek king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes will rise to power in Egypt. 
And Antiochus Epiphanes is, decides that he wants to be so great that he's going to start to move north and conquer the lands around him. And he moves and he, he comes into Israel and he takes over and he conquers Israel. And this is after the temple has been rebuilt because Nehemiah rebuilt it already. Israel is back in, in its place, uh, supposedly. And he comes in and he sets himself up as the king. Sets himself up as God. Sets himself up as the one to be worshipped. And he even goes to the point where he goes into the temple and he desecrates it. Now in those days, we're thinking, what does it mean to desecrate on it? Well, he sacrificed a pig on it, which made it unholy and unworthy. And it caused a great, great kind of rebellion in the people of Israel to where they were afraid of him, that they started following him. Now Daniel, thinking of this dream, this vision he's had, he asked the question, how long is this going, how long is this trampling going to take place? I know God is a God of justice, and he knows that God is real, and he's like, how long is this going to take place? And he says it's going to take place for 2,300 evenings and mornings. All right? Now what's the significance of 2,300? Was it literal? Was it like a period of 2,300 days? What does he mean by mornings and evenings? Now, a lot of scholars say that this actually refers to when they were having the sacrifice system, it was a morning and evening. They sacrificed in the morning and night. So there's 2,300 morning and evening sacrifices, which means that it was approximately 1,150 days that the, the, the temple would be trampled on. And in Jewish history, if you go from the time that Antiochus entered Jerusalem and did this in 170 BC, to the revolt, excuse me, I take that back, um, 167 BC to the revolt of Judas Maccabeus, which is in Maccabees, the book of Maccabees, in 167 BC, December 16th, 167 BC, would be the refurbishing and the restoring and the rededication of the temple, which is exactly 1,150 days from the time that Antiochus Epiphanes did this. So there's, there's a time frame, in, and why is that important for us? Well, it set the stage for who to come. The temple had to be restored so that the Messiah could come. The temple had to be rededicated so the Messiah could be the perfect sacrifice that was given. But all of this is, I mean, we, we think of this history lesson that Daniel is getting, and could you just imagine, just, just picture for a moment, you are Daniel, you are held captive, and you're seeing these visions of your people, the people of God, that are being... Uh, destroyed and trampled down and forced, you know, rebelling against God again. And you've been given privy to God's vision, but then told that this is supposed to be concerning the time of the end. And you, God's giving you little glimpses because the previous dream had to deal with the time of the end, the destruction of the, the, the mighty beast, the iron teeth, with the Holy One that would set up His kingdom and the kingdom that will last forever. And so this is not only is a, a moment in time, it's an actual picture of what is to come, a, a deceiving Christ that will deceive the entire world. And it gives us a picture of who Antiochus was, who's a picture of the Antichrist. I mean, look at how he's described here in verse 23. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a messenger of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people, the Israelites. All right? The beautiful land in verse 9 is the, is the land of Israel. Because God can, made it beautiful. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Look at the, the comparison here is that the Antiochus Epiphanes is going to be a picture of the Antichrist at the end who's going to deceive Israel into a false security. We know that according to Revelation chapter 4 or chapter 5, excuse me, he comes out as one riding with a bow with no arrows, which is a sign of false peace. He's going to set himself up and try and save the world. Only to it at the midpoint, when he, he's wounded, he's resurrected like Jesus was to proclaim that he is the Christ, he is the superior one. All right, and he's going to de, to then turn on Israel and destroy Israel. That's what's coming. I mean, this is, Daniel is getting this vision that his people are going to face someone who's going to deceive them. 
this person is going to be a picture. This person was a picture of what we see in Revelation. I mean, the, the, the correlation. He achieved great power by subduing others. Antichrist. We know he arises and he deceives the ten kings and kills three of them. All right? He will rise to power by promising false security. He will be intelligent and persuasive. He will be smooth with his words, unlike me. Man who lives, makes a living by his words, and sometimes my tongue gets twisted, or I go faster than my, my brain goes faster than I can speak. But he will be smooth. He'll be a smooth talker. He'll be intelligent. He'll be persuasive with his words. He'll be controlled by another. He'll be controlled by Satan. He'll be an adversary of Israel and subjugate Israel to his authority. And the Antichrist, in the end of the three and a half period, he will set himself up as God and sacrifice on the temple again. He will rise up in opposition to the Prince of Princes, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will come against Jesus and chase after the destruction of the world because he will think he is better. His role will be determined by divine judgment. This is important because in history, Antiochus Epiphany didn't die by man's hands. It says that he went off and he died out of his mind. It's kind of interesting that God took care of him. Just like in the end, the Antichrist, what does it say? Man will not destroy, but who will? God will, because he will cast him at the end into the lake of fire. I mean, if you turn to Revelation chapter 13, John is given a picture of the Antichrist, and this is what it is. And it says, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the power, the beast his power and his throne and great authority. On one of the heads of the beast seemed to be have a few fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for forty-two months. It opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life and the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they must go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. I'm going to leave, read this last part of the verse because this ties into where we're going to tie in the end of Daniel. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Just because we know a part of history, just because we know one of the events, Sometimes it scares us. Sometimes it makes us sick. Sometimes we try and figure out, is it this person or is it that person? Oh, that person could be this, could be the Antichrist. Look at the way they talk. Look at the way they dress. Look at the way they walk. At the end of Daniel, it says, I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. See, Daniel was completely overwhelmed, overcome by this vision that God had given him. So much so that it made him sick. Has there ever been a point in life where we, we read something, God shares something, that we are overwhelmed by the, the tenacity of it, the ferociousness, the, the ferociousness of it, that we're sick to our stomach by what God has said, even in a personal way. But what do we do in response to what God has shown us? John says this calls for us to patiently endure, to be faithful. Daniel here, it says, he, he was sick to his stomach for several days, but then he got up and went about the king's business. He was sick to his stomach, he was laid down, he was broken by this, but yet he knew he had a job to do. And he got up from it and he went about his task, knowing what was coming. Knowing that King Belshazzar wasn't going to live very much longer. Knowing that God's judgment was coming. Knowing that these future things that God had shown him, God was bringing forth the redemption of his people in some way and dealing with the world. The strain left the mark on this old prophet. 
Daniel is, is no young buck anymore. He's been in captivity for many years. He's been in the king's authority, and he's, he's been a wise man for many years. And this, this particular dream left a mark on his body. But he was not the kind of man to let spiritual things interfere with his secular responsibilities. He recovered from his illness and gave his mind to the business that God had placed him in. We do not know what position Daniel held in the government at this time. We don't know where it was because we know later in, in, when Belshazzar had seen the handwriting of the wall, he says, if you tell me what this means, I'll make you the second most highest man in this land. And Daniel said what? Keep it all. Because he knew that he wasn't going to last very long. It wasn't even going to matter. <laughs> all right? But it says no matter what it was, he undoubtedly gave his diligent attention to his work, his his place of employment, his job, his ministry that he had, keeping his spiritual problems to himself. He didn't allow what, what was provoking him on the inside to come out and impact the ministry he had in being an advisor, a wise man. How much times, or how many times do we allow the spiritual problems we face, me included, to come out of our lives and impact our role in ministering to one another? Or even to minister, to keep us from ministry because we are not trusting God. We're not, we're giving in to the fear of the spiritual unknown. Or, or the, uh, I don't understand this. Or, I'll never understand this. So I, I just, you know, it, it keeps us from doing what we're called to do. What are we called to do, church? Jesus said you are called to what? Go and what? Make disciples. So knowing that the, the end is coming, knowing that the future has been prophesied, God's perspective is judgment is going to be coming. The restoration of Israel will happen. These things are true and real. I, mean, I love this part of verse 26. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true. This is true. But seal up the vision for it concerns the distant, distant future. Seal up this vision because it has to do with what I'm going to share with you here in a couple days. Or a couple years. Because I'm going to give you some more visions. Daniel, but okay, we'll just do this a step at a time. But Daniel's response was to take it to heart and then go about what God had placed him to be doing. Prophecy is something that shouldn't overwhelm us, even though it does. But we need to take it to heart. We need to process it and not let it, let it keep us from doing what God has placed us in this world to do. We must not let anxiety, we must not let worry, we must not become fixated on what might be next or who that Antichrist might be. We don't know. What we do know is we've been given a task and our job is to fulfill that task no matter what we do know or not. We must be like Daniel, even though we are exhausted over this or we're worn out by what God is telling us is going to happen. We must get up. We must go about the business that God has given us. We must overcome the physical ailments that come from some of these things. And we must serve Faithfully, which is why I, I, that verse there in, in Revelation 13, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Church, we've been given a glimpse into the future. We've been given the words of God, even going back to Daniel, hundreds of years, thousands of years before us, he's been given a glimpse of the end if he was still faithful to get up and go do the task that God had for him, even though he knew what was going to happen. He didn't try and set up some sort of, you know, um, recovery place, or he didn't try and say, hey, king, you're going to die. He was faithful to serve the king. He was faithful to go about the business that God had, the place that God had put him in. How about us, church? How are we doing? When we think about this prophecy, we're like, well, that already happened. I mean... Medo-Persian Empire is done, the Greek Empire is done, the Antiochus, what does that have to do with us? Well, remember, this little horn was a picture of what's to come. And if you read in history, go back and read for yourself the history books of what Antiochus Epiphany did. It's only a small foreshadowing of what the Antichrist is going to do to the whole world. And it should scare us. It should move us in our hearts to think about how bad this is, but it should scare us to the point of saying, am I doing what God has commanded me to do? Am I being faithful and enduring as I ought, that others may come to know Christ? 
prophecy for us, church, isn't about fully knowing everything. Because a lot of this prophecy happened through Daniel. Happened, well, we've already seen the fulfillment of it. But it should be an encouragement and a record to us that what God has already spoken and fulfilled means he's going to fulfill what he hasn't done yet. That it is true and it is going to happen. And therefore, our response is to be faithful, to persevere. Our response is to be like that. And even though it makes us, we need to get up and we need to be faithful to our jobs, to our communities. We need to not let anxiety or worry or illness or these things Keep us back from doing what God has commanded us to do. So I pray, church, that we, we take this to heart as Daniel. We look at verse 27. We don't fixate on the prophecy. We fix on, fixate on verse 27, and we take the words to heart. But we get up, and we go do what God has placed us to do, to be the salt and the light to this world. Because we know what's coming we should have a sense of urgency to live a better life, that others too may not face that judgment. Let's be that kind of people. Let's be a people like Daniel that knows this. But let us get up and keep going moving forward for the glory of God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we Think through the details of Daniel chapter 8 in this vision that you gave Daniel. I can't even fathom being in Daniel's shoes, sitting there, Lord, in the third year of the king of Babylon and getting a vision of, a, of an empire that's going to come and destroy the empire you're living in. And then after that, another one's going to come. But out of that one's going to rise someone who's going to devastate Israel again. And Lord, I know that Daniel's heart was for his people and Lord, for you. But he didn't allow it to keep him down. He didn't allow it to keep him from the task and the duties that he'd been placed, placed under to do, from his responsibilities. And Lord, I pray that we too would be faithful in our responsibilities, faithful in our, our mission, faithful in our call to represent you, to, to preach the gospel to this world because the world desperately needs it. Because the end is coming, in which there's going to be a false Christ. The Antichrist is going to rise, Lord, and he's going to deceive so many people with smooth words. And we're already seeing that as many are falling away from the church or falling after um, smooth talkers and people that are preaching a false gospel and others, Lord, that are deceiving them into a false hope. So, oh, Father God, I pray that the words that we know are true, the words that we know that are real, Lord, would go forth from our lives and, and would keep us, Lord, uh, to be faithful, to endure, to persevere in this world for your name's sake. Oh, Lord God, help us and forgive us for the times that we are anxious. Forgive us for the times we do worry about things or we, that keep us from serving you and ministering. And help us to put our full trust in you and in your plan and in your life. For we know that you're, you're working all things out for your glory. And so, Lord, we submit our lives and ask that as the people here at Small Point Baptist Church, we would be a people, Lord, that are surrendered to the call you've placed in our life, to the responsibilities around us in being your witness. We thank you now for your name we pray. Amen. And as we close today, we're going to close by singing hymn 548, As the Deer. Please stand. I oh, want trustees, don't forget, we have a meeting right after service.
miss you all. Good to see you too. <laughs> well, we will definitely then pray today for your safety as you guys prepare to depart and travel. Church, we have a we have a mission outside of these walls to the people around us. We have responsibilities in our lives. Let us be faithful to them. Let us shine bright the love that God has shined in us through all that we do, that we can have an impact on this world. Every second, every moment of every day. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to be your servants. You've given us responsibility. You've given us a place in this world to be a light, to be salt. Lord, I pray as we go out, may we go out in your, in your name and in the power of your spirit, being faithful and enduring each and every day for your glory. That we may take and make the most of every opportunity prepared, Lord, in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. And Lord, we pray for our dear brother and sister, for Roger and Carol as they depart this week to go back to Florida. Lord, how precious it is, it, how precious it is every year when they come and be with us. And we pray, Lord, that you would give them safety, you would give them uh, health as they are away, continue to use them down there in Florida as I know you do. And I pray you would just return them to us next year, if, you're Lord, if it is your will, safety as well. And Lord, we ask that all of us, Lord, as we go out from here, we go out in your safety and your protection, being faithful until the end. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week.